All right, this topic is a very interesting one indeed. This is uh, the transonic zone and maximum effective ranges for long-range precision rifle shooting. Now, uh, you may remember way back when we were talking about uh, cartridge selection and projectile selection for your long-range rifle, but we defined our maximum effective range of most rifle systems to be the maximum supersonic range of that uh, cartridge projectile combination. The reason for that is because of problems that are experienced when the bullet crosses the sonic barrier. Beyond the sonic barrier, when the bullet uh, decelerates below the speed of sound due to shifts in the bullet center of pressure and other things going on, predicting where that thing's going to fly becomes extremely difficult. So what is the transonic region? Well, as uh, many of you probably know, if you're into this series or if you're into physics, the speed of sound changes through different mediums. So you have different air densities. Your speed of sound is going to vary a little bit. Generally speaking, it's going to be around 760 miles an hour approximately, but that varies with air density. As your medium changes, so does your uh, speed of sound. Now, there's a, a specific velocity region that we're going to label as the transonic region. Transonic meaning you're going from one sonic zone into another. Uh, subsonic versus supersonic. In this case, subsonic being below the speed of sound, obviously, and supersonic being faster than the speed of sound. But the transonic region is generally defined as about Mach 1.2 to uh, Mach 0.8. And uh, Mach 1 is basically the speed of sound. Mach 2, just for sake of conversation, is two times the speed of sound. Uh, you know, Mach 0 0.5 would be half the speed of sound. So uh, that's what we're talking about when we say Mach. But uh, the transonic zone, as defined for our purposes, is that, uh, that velocity region between Mach 0 0.8 and Mach 1.2. And uh, what we have happen in this transonic region... And this is usually pretty far out for most modern center fire rifles. This is a little bit beyond 1,000 meters, maybe right around 1,000. For some of your uh, more efficient projectiles being launched a little faster, it'll be around 1,500 meters or so, maybe a little more. Uh, but basically, what we have happen once we uh, encounter this transonic region really far out there is your center of pressure, and we talked about the center of pressure earlier, begins to shift when we enter the transonic region. Now, depending on the bullet's tractability and how well its nose is still pointed on with its uh, line of motion, different bullets will react differently when going through this transonic zone. If the bullet has too much yaw when it goes through this transonic zone, it's uh, probably going to lose dynamic stability, and that's going to cause significant dispersion beyond that point due to coning motion that starts, which can lead to uncontrollable tumbling if that coning isn't damped out fast enough. Even if a bullet kind of regains its dynamic stability, it's, it might have been thrown way off its flight path due to that uh, radical yaw going through that transonic zone before the, uh, the coning motion had a chance to get damped out. So to make a long story short, what we basically have here in the transonic zone is a significant reduction in your dynamic stability, which makes predicting... The ballistic behavior of uh, that bullet beyond that point extremely difficult to accomplish. And even the best mathematical models used to try to predict that action are, are not going to be reliable enough to use for shooting at any kind of high-value targets, whether you be hunting or in a tactical situation or in a target shooting competition. So your maximum effective range, there's no doubt that the bullet's going to fly a lot farther than the transonic barrier, but your maximum effective range is going to be limited to its supersonic range. So the question is, is there any way to mitigate this problem or reduce the, the negative effects of uh, the transonic zone has on your bullets? Well, yeah, there's some things that you can do to uh, extend your range a little bit. Some of the obvious ones are increasing your projectile's efficiency. You know, a bullet with a higher ballistic coefficient is going to retain its velocity for a longer distance. That'll extend your supersonic range. Obviously, if you launch the bullet a little faster from the muzzle, that will extend your maximum supersonic range as well because it's going to be starting off the initial speed that's greater, right? Another thing you could do is uh, find an area to shoot at that has thinner air. You, know, you can climb on top of a mountain and shoot from up there, and uh, you're going to have 
thinner air, so your maximum supersonic range is going to be farther out because your bullet is going to retain its velocity longer with less air resistance, right? But then again, we can't always choose where the target's going to present itself unless you're setting up your own steel targets all the time or something. But for hunters and uh, for tactical military applications, that's not an option usually, okay? So there's another thing that uh, we need to become familiar with, and that's balanced flight technology. And uh, this is something I mentioned earlier that I thought I could explain. And then after you understand how this works, we can use what we learned from it and uh, kind of apply that new information to our system and see if there's anything we can do to stretch out that max range just a little farther. So what is uh, balanced flight? What are we talking about here? Well, as we discussed on the prior videos, we talked about how the at extreme long ranges, your bullet leaves at an angle of departure. You usually have to elevate, you know, your rifle a little bit. Usually, if you're shooting at extreme ranges, you're going to be shooting 30 minutes of angle, 40 minutes of angle, maybe as high as 50 or 60 minutes of angle. Uh, still less than a degree of, uh, in, of elevation, but uh, still it's uh, what we consider for our purposes to be a high angle of departure, okay? And uh, as that bullet is launched forward, it's going to start to drop, and there's going to be a parabolic arc. And at the descending leg of that uh, trajectory, most rifle bullets are going to be coming down through that descending branch with their noses pointing just a little bit higher than the direction of the actual flight path. Now, although this yaw can be somewhat problematic even at those ranges, you really start to get a problem when you approach the transonic zone and you have a supersonic shockwave in front of a, a bullet going above the speed of sound that uh, is kind of on the front of the nose of the bullet. It's in front of the bullet. Now, as you start to decelerate through the, the sonic barrier, uh, a, a sonic shockwave is basically you get the air compressed into a shockwave. Uh, it's displacing air, and uh, it gets compressed into a solid shockwave. Now, uh, the, the nature of that shockwave is a science unto itself, and there's lots of material you'd have to read to completely understand what's going on there with uh, how these shockwaves behave under various velocity regimes. But basically, once you start going through that transonic zone, that shockwave, you're starting to pierce through it. And if that bullet isn't pointed exactly nose on with this direction of flight, you're going to have problems. Now, you may remember from our discussion earlier that your center of gravity on a spinning rifle bullet is going to be behind the center of pressure. And that center of gravity is constantly waiting for an opportunity to get in front of that center of pressure. That's why you have to spin stabilize a bullet, right? So uh, if you introduce any kind of radical turbulence onto a bullet or if you change where that center of pressure is, which does happen when it goes into the transonic zone, your, your, your center of pressure does shift. And when you bust back through that sonic barrier, there are now a variety of excuses for that center of gravity to try to get in front of that center of pressure again. And uh, that will basically cause that coning motion and even tumbling if it's uh, bad enough. So beyond the sonic barrier, your, your bullet just goes dynamically unstable. So the question comes up, how do you keep it stable going through that zone, right? Well, there's a, a few different ideas on this, and this is where if you read some of the various blogs and even some of the published ballistic uh, sources in different journals and magazines, there is a variety of opinions on how to accomplish this balanced flight. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to argue with anybody. I mean, this is a cutting-edge science, and there's a lot of debate on exactly what's going on. Even the Ballistics Research Laboratory is still wrestling with this, trying to figure out the math. There's a six degrees of freedom model they got going. And uh, there's even the, the really smart guys who have all the math figured out. If you can read between the lines on their uh, published articles, they're kind of yelling at each other, disagreeing and saying how their model's better than the other one and uh, revealing some of the problems. And uh, that's what you have when you have such a dynamic reality as these external ballistics and you're trying to quantify it in the form of math. It's, it's really hard to do. So uh, like I said, I welcome discussion on this matter. It's a cutting edge science. I'm just going to present some of the uh, thoughts and ideas and how different outfits have kind of accomplished a practical degree of balanced flight and uh, it has yielded pretty good results. So one of the ideas is that if you increase your static stability by uh, increasing your rifle twist, 
that should, when that bullet gets to that transonic zone, any turbulence that's introduced is going to be dampened out kind of by that increased static stability. So this is why a lot of guys are talking so much about the stability number that they've calculated based on twist and other things that we discussed earlier. Uh, they, they like to have that, that higher stability number because uh, the idea is that when you go through the transonic zone, you, you should be better off. It'll overcome any of those uh, shifts in pressure. Now, I would certainly agree that that's a pretty logical assessment just based on that information, but there are a lot of other things going on here that need to be considered with that idea. The main idea is we discussed earlier tractability. Now, if you missed the video on this, you're going to want to check that out. But basically, your tractability is the ability of that uh, projectile to, to keep its nose pointed on with its direction of its flight throughout its trajectory path. Like we just said, bullets being launched from a high angle of departure and uh, have a significant amount of uh, static stability are not going to be able to... Uh, maintain their tractability as well at extreme ranges during that descending leg because you've increased the rigidity of that axis. So it's not going to want to, uh, the, the pressures that are pushing the nose back down are not going to be able to overcome that uh, the stiffness in their uh, rotational axis. So basically, too much static stability is a bad thing at extreme long ranges due to that. And a lot of guys argue that the, the, it isn't a problem and there's no such thing as overstabilization. But that's for most uh, people's applications, shooting within, you know, 600, 800 meters. When you're talking extreme ranges, the high angle departure shots, when we're shooting like a mile or really far out there, it does start to be a factor. And this is something that field artillery guys have to take into consideration. And uh, there is a certain loss in tractability every time you up your your actual stability factor. And that's going to end up biting you in the butt when you're trying to go through that transonic zone because you're not nose on with your direction. So a lot of you guys might be asking, well, why don't we try lowering the twist rate so that our uh, stability number is lower and then you maintain your tractability, okay? Now on the surface, this seems counterintuitive because you're lowering your static stability, but you got to remember that you, uh, when we're talking about extreme long range shooting, dynamic stability becomes very, very important. And by lowering your static stability at long ranges, you increase your dynamic stability because you retain your tractability. The ability of that projectile to uh, have its nose pointed down on with its trajectory path uh, is increased if you just back off on your stability factor just a little bit. And that's why uh, if you're looking at some of the software we were making available to you guys, there is a barrel twist analyzer. And uh, there's a little note in there and it says projectile stability closer to 1.4, uh, you know, rather than 2.0 is better for extreme long ranges involving flight in the transonic. That's what that's talking about there. Uh, the lower static stability, which is what the stability number is kind of talking about, is going to increase your tractability because it's not going to um, make that that, that uh, spin axis is going to be less rigid so that uh, the forces pushing down on that bullet nose that we discussed earlier are going to be able to keep it nose on a lot better. Now, there is a happy balance in here because if you lose too much of your static stability, okay, that's going to be problematic as well at long range. So there, there's a happy medium. You want both, but you don't want too much of either. <laughs> okay, sounds kind of weird, but that's the way it is. You want enough static stability to keep it gyroscopically stable, to keep it, uh, you know, statically stabilized uh, going throughout its entire flight. And you also don't want too much so that you retain your dynamic stability through the transonic barrier. That's what we're talking about when we talk about balanced flight. We're kind of balancing those two different stabilities out. Now, this is something that has been worked on for quite a long time. There's a lot of different guys out there who would see value in this, particularly when you're talking about those long-range artillery applications, naval gunfire, things like that. Um, so th there's been a lot of guys put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into trying to figure out how to do this. In the sporting world, in the world of shoulder-fired rifles, center-fire rifles, the kind that you and I would just shoot, uh, there's a company that comes to mind, Shytac, and they developed the M200 interdiction system in the 408 Shytac. And the thing that made that thing so popular was this tremendous ability to maintain its dynamic stability 
through that transonic zone. And that basically increased your maximum effective range out to as far as that projectile flies within the parameters of your circular air probability or basically, uh, you know, how big your group is at a certain distance given your target size, okay? So if you're shooting at a 15-inch target, your, your rifle is no longer limited to your supersonic range. It is now limited just to the dispersion that you would have at any given range. So using balanced flight, your only limitation is your accuracy. You don't have to worry about the transonic zone throwing you off. So that's why the four-way uh, shy tack is kind of renowned for being kind of the beast, you know, as far as long range. And a lot of guys don't understand exactly what's going on there, um, but that's one of the reasons why I, have, I had it listed on one of my charts earlier that the, its maximum effective range is actually a lot farther than the supersonic range. Uh, the, 50, the 50 BMGs, the 416 Barrett, some of those other cartridges that are a lot more powerful, and uh, you, like the 416 Barrett is externally very impressive when you just look at the external ballistics. But uh, when you consider the uh, dynamic stability of the two cartridges, the 416 Barrett versus the 408 Shytac, that's where the 408 really actually retains its actual accuracy beyond the transonic zone, something the 416 wasn't specifically designed to accomplish, although there are uh, projectiles being developed for all these different rifles that uh, are better, so the, the technology is increasing. But the way Shytac did this, and you can read through the patents, or I do believe they probably advertised it, they probably had a guy write up in, in layman's terms how it works, but they de developed a, a projectile with a very specific profile, okay, and they, they developed it in conjunction with a, a certain rifling pattern to where uh, when this bullet is fired, it's rotational, Velocity, the, the amount that it's spinning, okay, decreases at a rate that's more proportional to its deceleration of its forward motion so that you don't uh, have too much static stability as you get too far out there. Like we said earlier, when you fire a bullet initially from the, from the rifle, it's, it's spinning extremely fast and it's, uh, its forward velocity decays a lot faster than its rotational velocity does. So as you get farther out there, at extreme ranges, your uh, stability number actually starts going up because proportionally, it's not moving forward as fast as it was, but it's spinning, it's retaining its spin uh, longer. So proportionally speaking, it's spinning faster than it was in proportion to its forward velocity. And that causes your uh, stability to get too high and then you lose your tractability. Shytac figured out a way and they balanced out a design of a projectile and the rifling to where it doesn't do that. It's balanced. It, uh, it loses its spin in such a way to where it's more balanced at long ranges as your forward velocity also decays. And that's how you, uh, the 408 Shytac retains its tractability. That's really what it's accomplishing. The nose stays pointed on and it still has enough static stability to get through that transonic zone because you're still experiencing those turbulences and that uh, change in the center of pressure. But uh, it's uh, maintaining its uh, dynamic and st uh, static stability beyond that point. And so even though there's a tiny bit of turbulence introduced, it's not going to throw that thing off wildly. So those things can shoot out 2,200, 2,500, 3,000 meters uh, depending on your circular air probability, that's your, uh, you know, your general accuracy of that rifle, uh, your precision potential. So a lot of guys uh, just look at the raw ballistics between like the, the 416 and the 408 is a good example because the, the, the 416 looks like it's got a lot more horsepower out there, but actually the 408 uh, retains its dynamic stability better. And that's what we're trying to accomplish for long range accuracy purposes for precision shooting. If you're just trying to get the bullet there with more power, that can be accomplished with other projectiles and other cartridges, no problem. But uh, it also had to do with the way their, their rifling was built to where the grooves left on the bullet would be uh, arranged in such a way that it would create the right kind of air resistance to help slow down those RPMs so that it could maintain its tractability and decrease the stability number. They really put a lot of thought into that, and they did a lot of testing to get it figured out. But it actually uh, did res uh, result in pretty good performance beyond the transonic uh, barrier. So can this be done in other cartridges? It absolutely can. It's just really a matter of matching the right twist rate with, uh, with the right bullet 
And although you might not be able to achieve a perfect balanced flight, and that's extremely hard to do without uh, really just designing it from the ground up that way, you can get better performance uh, through that transonic zone. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I don't harp too much on guys to use the, the highest twist rate possible for a given bullet in a, you know, in a certain rifle because I'm, a guy's got to be aware that increased twist, uh, if you have too much twist more than is necessary to stabilize that bullet, you do increase the likelihood of problems when you get into that transonic zone. So uh, if you back off on your twist, just have just enough to stabilize the bullet you're using, you might have better probability of actually attaining a more balanced flight into that transonic zone. Now, it's not a guaranteed deal. Your atmosphere is a big factor in there. Uh, this does ch All this math changes uh, with atmospheric density and uh, a lot of other factors. So it's not something that you can just make a blanket statement about. It's very, very dynamic, like we said before. But generally speaking, that is something to be aware of. Um, if you already have a rifle all set up and you put a lot of coin into it and you're worried, oh man, I have to change my twist now. No, you can simply up your bullet weight and uh, you get a longer, heavier bullet uh, for, the, for that thing. So use the heaviest bullet possible, the longest, heaviest VLD st style bullet possible that that, that twist can uh, handle or what it's advertised to handle. And you got to remember, too, that when, when we're having this discussion or when you're trying to explain this with someone else who you might be uh, teaching someday, uh, you got to define all your parameters before you even get into the conversation because guys will argue uh, because they haven't defined all their terms. What we're talking about is extreme long-range precision shooting where you have a high angle of departure where your tractability becomes an issue, okay? Now, for normal shooting 300, 500, 600 meters, 800 meters even for like, even for military snipers uh, equipped with 308s, it's not going to really be an issue for them. So this whole concept may be something that is pretty much non-existent for a lot of different shooting disciplines. However, for our particular shooting discipline, extreme long range precision shooting, it is an issue for sure because uh, we're, we're pushing it right up to that transonic zone all the time. And I can witness that uh, basically, in my experience, I've used a lot of different rifles to where the twist rates would be considered by most uh, shooters, even long-range shooters, to be not enough to stabilize the bullets I was using. I do use uh, a lot of varmint configuration rifles from time to time for long-range shooting, and I do use bullets sometimes that are right on the border of being too heavy or maybe just a little over the border of being too heavy. A good example is my Ruger... Um, M77 VT. I believe the twist is one in nine or something like that. And uh, I use 105 grain AMAX as a lot of guys would argue that you need a little bit tighter twist to uh, stabilize that bullet. And that statement is true when you're talking static stability. If you want to get that uh, stability number to be right on, then that that's a true statement. However, for the purposes of what I was doing, I was shooting 1200, 1300 meters with a 243. Uh, I didn't want over-stabilized projectile to where that spin axis would be so rigid to where it would not uh, retain its tractability and uh, that would uh, really, really throw you wildly off. But for my shooting discipline, for my purposes, uh, it was pretty much perfect and I got amazing results at extreme long ranges with the 243 uh, just because of uh, that awareness of the tractability issues. Uh, the same can be said for any other uh, caliber uh, in twist rate, uh, a lot of guys ask about the 30 calibers, and there's the, one of the most common questions I get in regards to twist rate is what twist should I use for my 308? And again, when uh, making any kind of recommendation, it's very, very important to note all your conditions you're going to be operating in. So this is going to be contingent upon atmospheric density, operating temperature has a big bearing on density, things like that. Altitude is going to have a bearing on density. So depending on your conditions, uh, that's going to uh, tweak your, your uh, recommendation just a little bit. But in the case of the 308, a, a general recommendation there when using the 168 Green Sierra uh, M852 bullets would actually be a 1 in 12 twist. I would recommend that over the 1 in 10 inch twist when we're talking about maintaining tractability so that we can get uh, out to that transonic zone and maybe a little bit into it. Uh, maybe even a tiny bit past the sonic barrier. Uh, you'll maintain 
uh, a lot better accuracy potential at those ranges if you don't have too much static stability. If a guy's planning on using the M118s, you know, the 173 grain bullets or the uh, 175 CR Match Kings, and you're operating in air densities that aren't too too thick, uh, like if you got high temperatures or if you're at high altitudes where you have thin air, you can get away with a 1 in 12 inch uh, twist even for those bullets. Now, if you wanted to maintain a cold weather safety margin for those same bullets because the air is going to be denser, uh, then you might want to up the twist just a little bit. Maybe a 1 in 10 would be more appropriate in that case. So it's something that you have to uh, determine based on multiple factors. If you're shooting real heavy bullets like 190 grain Sierra Match Kings, then you definitely want to use uh, the 1 in 10 twist. So uh, that's something that you need to look at uh, on an individual basis based on multiple criteria. Now, there might be a lot of guys out there who would uh, strongly disagree with those recommendations. Uh, but uh, interesting to note that the U.S. Army uh, Research Laboratory for Ballistics and the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, they put out a document entitled The Aerodynamic Characteristics of 7.62 Match Bullets by uh, Robert uh, McCoy in, I think, 1980s. And uh, according to that document, they had pretty much the same exact conclusions when talking about those three bullet choices. Uh, that you don't want too much twist to stabilize some of those bullets. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. So when you're looking for the proper twist rate for extreme long-range precision shooting, don't go with an extra twist just to have it. That's not actually going to help you. It might be counterproductive, especially as you approach the transonic zone. You might not attain full uh, balanced flight, but you will be doing better. When you, when you get into that transonic zone, and you might be able to push it a little a little farther than you normally would have. So, this topic of maximum supersonic range is one of the primary criteria when you're trying to determine your maximum effective range for your long-range rifle, okay? It's not the only criteria. There's lots of other things you want to be aware of to make that determination. Uh, you're going to have to be aware of the size of your target and the accuracy potential of your rifle, if you've got uh, two minute of angle accuracy potential and you're shooting at a gopher at a thousand, well, you're beyond your maximum effective range for that size target, obviously. That's something you need to take into consideration. Also, if you uh, are shooting a 243 at 1200 and you want to take out a, a bull moose, that's not going to be a good idea because of uh, remaining energy requirements and bullet design requirements. So we're going to discuss that in more detail before we get done here when we get into the topic of terminal ballistics. But that's for another time, a little bit more down the road. Uh, another thing to be aware of, and we're going to get into this uh, very, very soon, is your ballistic coefficients that are published. And there's a, there's a lot of problems with some of those ballistic coefficients, and we'll discuss the difference between G1, G7, and the different uh, ways to uh, quantify your ballistic efficiency of your, your projectile. But... Uh, your, your ballistic coefficient is also going to change based on which direction your bullet is pointing in any uh, position in his flight path. Uh, yaw is going to obviously decrease your, uh, your uh, ballistic coefficient. is going to increase your uh, drag, right? If your bullet's flying kind of sideways to the air, that's going to have more drag to it, obviously. And uh, one last note on the balanced flight technology before we go, and you probably already caught this, but for just to reiterate, when we're talking about the balanced flight technology being utilized in the 4 h shy tack a lot of guys think that they get the performance just by chambering a rifle in that cartridge. Uh, that is only the case if it is firing that projectile that was specifically designed for the shy tack patented rifling, which uh, is designed uh, as a unit. The, the bullet and the rifling are designed together to uh, attain balanced flight. So you can't just uh, throw on any barrel with any twist design and, and get that kind of performance. Um, and that, that applies for anything. But uh, just something to be aware of, to just to make that perfectly clear for the uh, sake of future conversations. But uh, to summarize this video here, uh, if you want to determine your maximum supersonic range, Unless you're talking about balanced flight technology, where it's just as far as you got, as far as your precision potential, um, you can simply take the load data from the cartridge you're uh, looking at and the, the projectile you're looking at using, and you can enter in 
the uh, information inputs into a ballistic program like JBM Ballistics, uh, I showed you that earlier, or uh, some of these other ballistic XLR sheets or whatever you're using. And um, d go ahead and uh, stretch that range out there real far. You know, get your range out to 2,000 meters and uh, go ahead and uh, watch the muzzle or, or watch the remaining velocity on a particular load, load for the atmospheric conditions you're going to be operating in. And a lot of these ballistic programs do provide a Mach number there. But uh, you can basically define your max supersonic range uh, once you approach that transonic zone. So once you get Mach 1.2, you're not going to be able to go a lot farther than that uh, reliably with any degree of precision. So that's how you make that determination. Uh, just go ahead and input those for the particular load and environmental conditions you're going to be operating in into ballistic software and just go ahead and look. And when that bullet starts getting into that transonic zone, you can know that that's your maximum uh, range limiting factor uh, for your max supersonic range. You might limit that maximum effective range even more so when, we, when you start talking about remaining energy and other requirements. But that's your maximum that's your, that's your limiting factor for your maximum range. Okay, so the next video, we're going to discuss drag effects on bullets in more detail. We're going to talk about G1 versus G7, some topics like that. Uh, very interesting and uh, pretty important to understand as well. Stay tuned. <laughs>